It is my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. John Hunter from Quick Launch, who's going to be talking about um, how to make space guns. <laughs> Hi, guys. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, John Hunter. This is Harry Cartland. He's one of the founders, and Rick Tugid's with me also. We're from Quick Launch. And what we're going to present to you folks is a technology that actually enables significant manned space exploration beyond what rockets ordinarily afford you. So what you're seeing there on the front page is sort of something out of Jules Verne, but in fact that's a 1,100 meter long tube with hydrogen at, at the aft section that drives a, uh, a payload that, that when it gets into orbit weighs about 1,000 pounds. So this will launch 1,000 pounds of propellant per launch every couple of hours at, at basically 5% of the current launch costs. And it's not science fiction. We all actually come from scientific disciplines where we build things like this. And Harry and I ran Project Superheart back in the 90s. So if you look in the National Enquirer and the tabloids back then, you'll see probably see pictures of us running around with giant guns. And uh, it actually happened. We, we ran a significant number of shots for the Air Force and other clients. And uh, we managed to blow the gun up once. Super, Superheart was blown up once. Rick, saved, Rick my, my boss at the time, saved me. He wrote a nice report that said it wasn't all bad. And we salvaged the project. Uh, so I'm going to walk you guys through why hydrogen gas guns are the way to access space and go to space affordably. Next. So what you see on the left, the top left slide is a picture of Sharp. That was a 425-foot-long gun we built in the 90s and ran it through the 90s uh, doing shots for various clients. And the interesting part about that, it was used hydrogen. Now, you guys are familiar with this stuff. The cops and robbers all use bullets that have nitrocellulose or gunpowder, black powder in the old days. But hydrogen has a molecular weight of two. And so it turns out hydrogen can shoot things up to 11 kilometers per second, which coincidentally is the escape velocity for Earth. 11.2, which is the world record for gas guns, is also the exact escape velocity for Earth. And so it's well matched to the requirements of orbital speeds. Now, you can see in the bottom left, it's actually firing. This is one of our shots. We did this for the Air Force. In those, in those days, we were launching uh, hypersonic scramjets for the Air Force. So these were Mach 9 vehicles. They were fueled by hydrogen. This, if you guys are aeronautical, have any background, it's sort of neat because uh, th this was during the NASP era, and no one has got anything to fly, sustained flight above Mach 5. We were shooting things at Mach 9, and, and between Mach 5 and Mach 9 in those days. And it would come out of the gun, it would turn on and burn for about 100 yards, and then it would vaporize when it hit a sand pit. We're launching at such high speeds that we never recovered any part of the projectile. They, they, were, so, they were so fast that when they stagnated on the sand in the, in the target area, it would it just vaporize. You would never recover anything. But the speeds of hydrogen are what make it, make it perfectly matched for launching things into space. And uh, the point of this whole story is that Jules Verne was right. He was a couple hundred years ahead of his time, but he was right. He just had to pick the right fluid. And the, the, right, the correct fluid is, is hydrogen. It's not gunpowder. So you'll see on the, on the top right, that's a, that's a uh, picture from Mount Adagdak. I was on the Aleutian Islands just before 9-11. I was there like this five days before 9-11, getting ready to, to start this project then. And uh, I took that snapshot. We superimposed the SOLIDWORKS of, of a system on that island. That would be launching payloads due east. And that would be, uh, those would coincide with a propellant depot that, that, would, that would help the, uh, the current ISS, the International Space Station. Uh, then down in the lower right is the mobile version, the sea launched version, and the benefit of that system is that it's not fixed. You can take this to the equator and you can launch to any inclination you want to in any elevation you want to. So for example, you, could, you had a client that wanted, say, 100 tons of propellant at, a, at 28 and a half degrees inclination, uh, like a lot of the Americans do. It's, it's extremely agile. It can, it can uh, turn on a dime and it can launch to uh, any elevation and inclination you need. Next. Now, this is the payoff here. Ordinarily, when you have a multi-stage rocket, you know, rockets typically are triple-staged in order to get out of the gravity well. And uh, you'll have about a 1 to 2% 2, 2 payload fraction. Now, if you look, the vertical axis is what you should pay attention to. Here, in that boxed area, you see those little four curves running through that. But the, uh, uh, those, those represent one- and two-stage rockets, either low-performance solid rockets or fairly modest-performance liquid rockets. And so I would pick the top two curves. Those are liquid rockets with an ISP of 320 seconds. That just means it's got a lot of impulse. Like LOX, that would be like a LOX RP1 mixture. And uh, you can see it's a 25% efficiency, 25% payload fraction on the high, very high end. 
And the horizontal axis is what's called drive fraction, which only some of the rocket guys know. That just means basically how much of your actual vehicle is made out of solid material that does not burn, okay? Like your casing for your rocket, your, your uh, aero shell, that sort of stuff. So you want that to be a, a small number if you can. But in fact, since we're G-hardening these things to launch them out of a gun, it's probably going to be somewhere between 10 and 25 percent. That's why I put that window there, okay? So, but the bottom line is, you're getting uh, above 20% payload fraction, you're getting 10 times as much payload per vehicle weight as you do with a conventional rocket system for delivering to or supplies into low, your low Earth orbit. Next. Okay, another picture of the super system. This is 1,100 meters. If you look at the, the aft section down there at the bottom, that's 500 meters deep, and this would be at, at the equatorial location. So it's 500 meters deep. The pressure's around 700 PSI external pressure. The gun's running internally at, at 15,000 PSI, so that's not a big deal for us. We're used to working at real high pressures. Uh, then you have a long launch tube. It's 1,000 meters long. So uh, if you stuck a person next to that, it would, it would be only uh, about half the diameter of that. Uh, thank you of that uh, giant tube that goes up there. And the, the donuts are there to stiffen it. They're, they provide stiffness so you can align the barrel because this is such a high speed system, you have to have exquisite barrel alignment. Unlike conventional powder guns where you can be off by a few a milliradian or so in the steel, you have to have really, really good alignment with your steel barrels. And the other thing that donuts do is they provide buoyancy. So for example, let's say you want to have this thing uh, launch things into geosync. It's going to have an elevation that's closer to eight to ninety degrees than this one shown here. So you, in that case, you would inflate the, you would inflate the uh, the donuts in the forward area, and you and you fill the other ones with water. So the thing would would do this; it would tilt up. And then, of course, you have like an oil servicing platform there in the middle. This is very reminiscent of Sea Launch, which is what Boeing put together with some some partners, and they were doing uh, Zenit two launches out of the equator for some years. They went bankrupt. They're 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 trying to recover right now. But we use the same technology for servicing oil platforms and oil rigs as, as we would for servicing this big tube. Next. This shows the business end of the system. And it, we don't put all the flames and the, and the smoke and the noise in here. This is a real simple little JPEG. But it shows it coming out. And you can see that's a basically a, uh, a three-meter diameter tube there at, at the muffler end. And what, what is not shown internally is there is is this is a classic silencer where you actually try and capture the gas. The stuff on TV, they don't actually capture the gas. They have it go through some things which, which cool it down. But in this case, we want to capture all the hydrogen that we can because we want to recycle the hydrogen every shot. You don't want to have to, to go and pay for more hydrogen each shot. We have built things like this that have recovered 97% of the hydrogen, no problem. So it's easy to build a muffler that can capture the hydrogen, and it's been done. We've done it ourselves. Next. Okay, this is what it's going to look like as it goes through the sky. We have run ablation codes on this with uh, the help of Sandia National Laboratory. They ran the Abreu's code, and it said that at six kilometers per second, we're losing about five inches of carbon carbon on the nose. And so if you look closely at the vehicle I'm going to show you in a minute, you'll see a little arrow spike that sticks out, out about a foot, like a welding rod. And so that's going to take the lion's share of the thermal, uh, thermal Q dot in, in the parlance, okay? And it'll 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 uh, ablate off, but you'll still have uh, everything else protected. Next. Okay, so now this is at 100 kilometer altitude. This thing has left the muzzle at six kilometers per second because it uses hydrogen. Ordinary guns can come would come out maybe at two kilometers per second. We're at six kilometers per second, so we're two thirds of the way there in terms of velocities. The orbital speed you need. Uh, is about 7.6, but when you subtract off the gravity losses and, and, and the atmospheric losses, in reality, you need about nine clicks, nine kilometers per second velocity to get into a nice 500 kilometer LEO orbit. And so this, is, this shows it at 100 kilometer altitude, and you, we've blown off the aeroshell. The aeroshell, that's that heat shield that, that shields it during the, the uh, egress through the atmosphere. And then the base comes off, and what you see there is two canisters that contain fluids. And they contain fluids for two reasons. One is, it's, this is actually a single stage rocket. So it's going to have probably an RP1 LOX mixture there to provide a decent ISP. It's a liquid rocket. And the second reason is, one of those containers is going to contain the payload. Because we are, our job is to make money by delivering payloads to a space depot. Next. OK, so now. Now, this is a, uh, a classic plug nozzle. It looks like, uh, maybe unlike some of the rocket nozzles you've seen, but it's a perimeter nozzle, basically. 
And it's got some benefits. When you're under high Gs, you don't want to have things stick out really far because they'll break off, they'll crumple. So this is a plug nozzle, which is quite short, but it's, it's circumferential around the body of the vehicle. And there's an attitude control system I've not shown you here as well, but it's very simple. And so this thing is burning. Now we're, we're approaching 500 kilometer uh, altitude. Next. Now this is the space, the space station, but it's really just a depot. Now, you may have, some of you guys who follow this stuff in the literature, you'll see there's now been a resurgence in people who want to, want to put depots in space for providing propellant for going to the moon and going to Mars. It makes a total, it makes a lot of sense. All the explorers had uh, depots ahead of them, like the guys who did the North and South Poles had these big depots ahead of them. They would get to the depots and refill with dog food and food, and they would go on to the, to the North Pole. Well, so you do need depots in space in low orbit. But the nice thing about this one, the novel feature about this depot is there are no storage containers except the ones we launch up there. Okay, the ones, the classic ones you'll see in the literature all have these massive containers, and it takes about about seven uh, Falcon 9 launches to just to launch the containers up by themselves, okay? We have none of that. All we have is a manifold. We have a manifold and a smart vehicle. And you guys know that basically the smarts required to, to drive this thing into that hole are barely more than you'd use at Radio Shack to drive one of your kid's cars, okay? It's, it's not a complicated deal to do docking. And so the manifold is all we'd launch up with the Falcon 9, for example. That's the thing in the center. And then these inject in, they, they'll go in. We have an animation I was, that we may be able to get to work with you guys, but we'll see here. But uh, this will go ahead and dock with those, in those little holes there. And then the manifold will extract the fluid when a customer comes up and puts his credit card in, per se. Uh, you, can, you can extract the fluid just like you would at a local gas station. Next. This is a pretty view I snagged off some NASA website of the Earth at uh, 500 clicks. Next. Okay, now, now we'll see if this thing will run here. See if you can get it to go. Now, if it doesn't quit, we'll just, we're just going to fast forward past this. I'll show you the JPEGs. What do you think, Eric? It's not going to run. Okay, go ahead. Go to the next one. So. Let's show that again. Yeah, okay. Is this going to run up run here? Let's see if you. Okay. Uh, okay, this is, this is us. We actually, this is the real us. And uh, so that's us. I was on Matadagdag back in 01, just before 9-11. This is Harry running a solar project. And this is Rick drinking margaritas somewhere in the Bahamas. So uh, next. OK, these are quotes, the, the sort of current quotes. You know, Mike Griffin was the, was the head of NASA for a number of years. And, and Mike, believe it or not, actually gave me half a million bucks back in the 80s, late 80s, just when I started SuperHarp. And he was one of the first guys that gave us some cash. He says, John, if he's, he liked the project. He says, if you ever need more money, come back to me. He was the SDIO in those days. So I, need, of course, always needed more money. So I went back to him about, about a year later. He was gone. He, he had left and gone to NASA, unfortunately. But the, the sad truth of all the NASA administrators is they inherit a giant legacy of, of uh, job programs they have to fulfill for their congressmen. So they have all these things they got to do. Very little of the, what they actually have left is, is related to what you and I would be interested in, which is probably manned space exploration. They just want to keep these congressmen happy. You've got to build this. You've got to build that. You want to make this thing expensive so we can employ a bunch of people. So a real cynical appraisal of NASA would say it's, it's turned in for a, for a wonderful endeavor in the, in the 60s and 70s to have become a, a jobs program. And I know a lot of NASA guys and they're good guys, but that's from an outsider's point of view, they've unfortunately become a jobs program. So, but these are the quotes. Uh, Mike Griffin, these guys all want fuel depots. I think that's a natural, a natural candidate for our venture. Most recently, the Augustine report, they all, they all understand that the need for a fuel depot. But in fact, they need more than that. They need cheap fuel at the depot. They don't just need a fuel depot because anyone can launch them fuel, but it'll, it's going to cost them between five and 10,000 per pound. That's the current delivery price for propellant in orbit. So we will, we will deliver it for 5% for of that number. And uh, it all depends on, on uh, you know, and in reality, when you have these, these sort of uh, revolutionary changes, you never see a giant shock in the system. You never see, you know, wheat go from a dollar a pound to three cents a pound, right? You know, and the reason is there's always middlemen that will sort of massage that curve and make it more smooth, right? So you see shocks, what are called shocks in the physics world, where you have discontinuities, but you never see that in the real world in pricing and stuff. But what will happen is, even though our, our internal prices will be $200 a pound approximately, we'll probably end up charging more than that because we can't, okay? 
we're not going to be the, the usual uh, capitalist weasels, but there is, we have to pay some folks back, so we'll, there'll be a payback involved. But we assure you it's not going to be the 5,000 a pound that, that you will you see right now or the 10,000 a pound you'll see right now. But you'll see way under 1,000 a pound near term. And then we hope to asymptote out where we can make space extremely affordable where we're actually charging only, say, two or 300 bucks a pound. Next. Now, these are the classic curves. Now, I haven't, haven't tried to put in any, any uh, exotica here. Uh, the claim is that, that Falcon 9 is going to come in at some point when it gets, gets working, is going to come in about $2,000 per pound to Leo. And the conventional costs, they claim, are 5000 In reality, they're closer to 10000 but I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. And uh, so we're comparing ourselves. Now, obviously, our green curve is far superior to the other curves, but this is hypothetical, of course. But what happens, the, the flavor of the green curve is that after a few, about 50 tons, 50 tons of launch per year, you've amortized this system. So we amortize the entire gun. We pay off the gun. So it's like paying off your house. You can live in the house for free after that. And uh, the analogous thing would be a Falcon 9 had the first two stages paid for and they were free, okay, which they're not. Rockets will always have those first two pages that are going to be expensive. I'll call you back. <laughs> Sorry. Excuse me. Harry, handle that, would you? Uh, so, so basically, uh, <laughs> where was I? Anyways, uh, so the point is you got an E in the curve around 50 tons per year. And this is assuming 20-year amortization. I, I didn't go through all the exotica as far as internal rates of return and buy and sell and all that stuff, but anyone can do that with a spreadsheet. But you get the flavor of this, which is that we, we amortize the gun. The gun for, performs the first two stages for the rocket. We do launch a rocket, but it's a single-stage rocket. And that's why this thing is so affordable. It's, it's at least 10 times, if not 20 times more more efficient than a classic three-stage rocket. Next. Now, this is something that we did back in the 90s on a, on a really quick thing for DARPA. Because everyone says, well, can you launch uh, electronics? What can you guys really launch, right? So we said, well, we can launch a satellite. No big deal. So they, the DARPA gave us 40000 bucks. We spent about a month and a half in, at Largo, Florida, at International Test Systems. I didn't even use prints. We actually designed this thing sort of on, on a blackboard, built it. With, with the help of a machinist there pretty quickly. We had a GPS on it. We had uh, store and forward with cell phones. We had, those are photovoltaics. When I talked to Dan Golden, who was the, the other DAS administrator I knew, he says, John, this sounds wonderful, but I don't think you can launch photovoltaics. Well, we launch photovoltaics day in and day out. Photovoltaics are the easiest things to launch because they're so slim. And so we launched photovoltaics. We launched a GPS system, like I said. We had NICAD batteries out of Radio Shack for a power supply for this thing. We did this whole thing in two months for $40,000 and moved out, okay? We did 20 test shots, 3,200 Gs, worked like a charm. In fact, uh, I actually, I, I canvassed seven or eight experts in the field of G-hardening, and this is classic. I went to the JPL guy. He says, well, you, what you've got to do, you've got to buy the high sol 9309. You've got to pop this. It's going to weigh nine. You're going to increase the weight by a factor of, of 10, okay? It's going to be, you're going to really jack the weight up. So I talked to another guy at Livermore. He wanted to charge me 300 bucks an hour. He says, you've got to do these special little micro balloons and do this and pay me 300 bucks an hour and I'll advise you. Then I called, made a call to a guy at Picatinny Arsenal, an older gentleman. He says, John, those guys don't know what they're doing. Here's what you do. You just go to Walmart. You buy some, buy some epoxy at Walmart. It's got five KSI tensile on it. You know what solder bond strength is? Two KSI for the solder bond strength. He says, all surface mount electronics is really small. You will discover your safety patches are in excess of 100 on every part on your cell phone. I discovered that. When you drop your cell phone, which I want to do periodically, you, you can't break it. It's hard to break a modern cell phone because it's rated for a couple thousand Gs. They, they do drop tests on them. So automatically, most surface mount electronics is already G-hard. This old guy says, and this, by the way, his advice was free. He says, and the only problem you're going to have is transformers, okay? On your cell phone, things like that, you're going to find little pieces of metal that are sticking out that are fairly large. And just do the calculation. The stress is equal to the density times the height of the object times the, the G load, right? You know what the G load is going to be. You know the density of the object. Take a drug of scale to your hotel room, which Harry and I did. We took a drug of scale, looked like a bunch of cocaine dealers, and just taking this electronics apart and weighing each little part. And then we, then we used epoxy out of Walmart, and we put them along the sides of the things that looked like they were dubious. They didn't have safety factors over 100, okay? And so we potted everything that was necessary. We increased the weight of the whole thing by 2%. It was a 2% penalty, as opposed to the JPL guy, the Livermore guy. All the expensive guys were wrong. There would have been this guy who'd done this for a living for 20 years. It's a no-brainer for him, okay? So that's just an exercise in 
who you hire for one thing, but, but the point is G hardening is very, very easy to do. We did not harden any significant optics, I'll admit that. We had a small uh, TV camera on the front, which survived beautifully, no worries. But uh, we haven't even tried to harden optics. I suspect we could do it. And I suspect we would go to things like Fresnel optics if necessary, which you could spread out and and because uh, you don't want to have extended structures. But I don't think that would be too, too bad to do. But everything else we can harden until the cows come home. So one thing we do besides launch propellant would be to launch uh, satellites responsively. Because a lot of guys need satellites on short notice, but it takes them literally months to get them in the, in the, uh, in the queue and get the thing delivered. And then it's many, many millions of dollars. Next. So here's the rubber meets the road. We're, right now, we just started this little sojourn to raise money. And uh, we started off going to Boston to the SIS Space Investment Symposium 7. And then there was an article as a result of that that was in New Scientist. And now Popular Science is doing an article that's coming out this next month. So we're starting to get a little bit of publicity. And first thing we're going to do is we're going to break the current world record for altitude. That's a $2 million phase one. And that's with the super gun that we ran at Livermore. We're going to run it in a different configuration because this is a very vanilla shot for us. We're gonna, the difference is we're going to be shooting up. And so I can show you the configuration, but that, that's, a, that's on a scale of 10, that's about a 4 level of difficulty. It's very easy for us to do. That's a one-year project. The second phase is to do the orbital project, and that's on a scale of 10, about an 8. That's much harder. That's going to take us a couple of years. It's going to require 10 million because I've gotta, we've got to find some really good rocket scientists because most of us are just sort of fake rocket scientists and uh, build, this, build a vehicle up that will inject into orbit. So we need to orbit one kilo. Our goal, or phase two, is orbit one kilo, $10 million. And, of course, once that's successful, we raise the big money, which is the next one's $50 million for phase three. And that's, that's launching 100-pound payloads day in, day out with one of the systems like the ones you saw, only much smaller than the ones you saw there. And then, uh, it's, since I used to be a physicist, I always try to look at the extreme of things and look, look at mapping this to the future. We want to build a 1,000-pound launcher, one that launches actually 1,000 pounds of JP-4 or RP-8 or whatever, RP-1, whatever the guys want, xenon. I suspect it's going to be a lot of, of uh, hydrocarbons and locks would be my guess. But we want to do that. That's a three-year project, half a billion dollars. So that's the real, that's the bounty. And if you wanted to real, you could build even bigger, bigger ones if you wanted to. That's a two-meter diameter tube. It's a kilometer long. So if we can build big, long tubes, we can do that. And we have to heat the hydrogen up, but that's really pretty much it. And I wanted to tell you one more thing. I used to be a particle physicist when I was a kid, and uh, this is so much easier than that. Okay, in my discipline back in the days when you were getting into string theory and stuff, you know, you were lucky if you could calculate the mass of the proton within a factor of two or three or something, and no one ever could. Okay, and they still can't do it. And because uh, in the math we get extremely arcane and esoteric and all those weird words. And so when you go into, into one-dimensional gas dynamics, you, you're shocked how well things work. It's, it's incredible. My first gas gun I built, because I was a theoretician until I was 30 years old, first gas gun I built worked within 1% of my code predictions. 1%. It was, it was a shocker. You know, usually you're happy with it be within 20, 30%, and, or maybe factor two in particle physics. So it's very reassuring that the classical, the classical physics is so easy to understand. And this is not... This is not mentally challenging. This is the challenge here is to get the right team together and raise the cash and do this in a timely fashion while we're still young. Are we still young, Rick? <laughs> okay. So, uh, anyways, next view graph, Eric. Gas gun background. Uh, I could show you guys a bunch of physics, but I didn't have a lot of time last night, so I just whipped this up. Okay. Basically, they have the world record for speed. That's 11.2 kilometers per second. That is identically the same as escape velocity from the Earth by coincidence. That's purely because of the low molecular weight of hydrogen, molecular weight of two. Electric guns, everyone likes electric guns. I was hired at Livermore to build electric guns because I had a background in magnets and QCD and all sorts of weird things with magnetic fields. And it turns out they never, they never panned out like they were supposed to for a number of reasons, which I could go into. But fundamentally, they spent a few hundred million dollars, and they're still spending a month, and maybe still spending a lot of money on electric guns because there's this thing that, because there's this fascination with electricity. But in fact, rail guns, well, they, they have 10 or 20 names because every time one fails, they'll rename it, okay? <laughs> so, so the, you know, the rail gun's a classic one. You may have heard of coil guns. You may have heard of reconnection guns, quench guns, the snow gun, the coaxial gun, the pulsed induction gun. Basically, they're all V equals I. They're basically, they involve inductances and capacitances and switching times and, and energy storage and power conditioning, okay? 
fundamentally, it turns out they're just expensive as heck. And uh, I was one of the guys, that could, if you wanted someone to build a railgun, I would build a railgun for you guys, and it would work. But it would top out at two and a half clicks per second, basically, like the Navy's getting right now. The world record they ever got was five and a half clicks, five and a half kilometers per second. And they spent at least $200 million in the era I was involved in back in the 80s. They've spent more since then. So gas guns, basically, uh, it's, it's a tube. You put some hydrogen in it. You heat the hydrogen up. It gets to a hot enough temperature. You can look at the sound speed and let, release the thing. Okay, that's basically it. Now, you can do it in fancier ways, like you can inject along the sides if you want to. So that, that's sort of a nice thing, a nice nuance way to do it. Or you can increase the pressure by having some clever, clever switches in the aft section of the gun. But fundamentally, you're just letting the gas expand. It will work. It does work. And you, you try not to keep make the gas so hot that it melts the interior of the barrel. So typically, six kilometers per second is a good number for us. Uh, for several reasons. One of them is the hydrogen never gets above 1,700 Kelvin. And when you do the, the, the uh, heat exchange with the barrel interior, uh, it turns out it's a few hundred Kelvin below the melt temperature of steel. Steel melts around 1,700 K. So that's why six kilometers per second is good. Another reason six kilometers per second is good for the muzzle velocity is because the ablation penalties go like the velocity squared. Okay, so you're going to, the amount of mass you'll blade off, the Q dot in the nose goes like V cubed. But the time of flight goes like 1 over V, so the amount of mass you lose goes like V squared, basically. The side loads go like V squared, too. So all these things tend to be high powers of velocity. So 6 kilometers per second looks like a really good compromise number for us. We still get 20% payload fraction, and uh, we don't have too many penalties as we egress the atmosphere. Uh, if you, so electric guns, I hope I didn't beat up too many electric gun guys. They, they hate me in that community because we took all the world records for electric gun guys. Uh, but gunpowder... Gunpowder has been used by some people. You may have read some of the more colorful books about this guy, Gerald Bull, who was working for Saddam back in the first Iraq war. And he was killed by the Mossad, according to his books, uh, for his work with powder guns. And uh, he was an interesting guy. He came out of uh, Canada and a uh, very uh, dynamic individual, apparently. He was able to get the job done. He went to Barbados, and he put together a couple of Navy 16-inch guns and called it Project Harp. That was the high altitude research project, and they were able to launch sounding sounding uh, projectiles up into the ionosphere, things like that. Uh, but what happened was, Mr. Bull was he sort of went to the dark side because there was a lot of money in weapons, and uh, he was he was jailed uh, by our guys for like six months. He became very embittered. Went to went to Brussels, Belgium, started selling weapons on the international market. I was going to call him just before he got killed, and one of my consultants told me not to talk to him because he was dealing weapons. So I didn't call him, and he got killed about a month later. And this they stuck me in all the books as, as the evil, evil follow-on guy. But it, those are exaggerated. I'm not really that evil. So uh, gunpowder is a poor candidate. Three kilometers per second is not what you want to get things into orbit. And uh, typically, a not six like a 30 six, you know, the ones you guys are familiar with, only shoots around 3,000 feet per second on a good day. So it's maybe a kilometer per second or a little bit less on a good day. So. Gunpowder is not what you want. You do want to go at hydrogen. Uh, helium wouldn't be too bad, but it turns out since helium is monatomic, it has to, you have to run it a lot hotter than hydrogen to get the same performance. So you end up burning the barrel off with helium. So of the two light gases, you pick, you pick hydrogen every time, and you deal with hydrogen is relatively safe. You just have to know, it, you know when it escapes, it floats up. And uh, it's actually a lot safer than people give it credit for. It's safer than, for example, a lot of the pooling hydrocarbons like propane that will pool on you or and uh, it can form explosions in a confined space. But, so we've never had an issue with hydrogen. Uh, orbital velocity 7.6. So it's perfectly matched. From a physicist's point of view, hydrogen is matched to the problem. We're in a deep gravity well. Turns out because GMM over R squared is so large, we have, to, we have to have a lot of juice on the projectile. And the only way to get that is with the lowest molecular weight you, gas you can buy, which is hydrogen. Next. The picture of Sharp back in the 90s. Next. If you guys want to see this, this is probably on the internet. They did a bunch of stuff with, on web pages where they showed the construction. It was an L-shaped gun. It had a 260-foot-long like, pump tube, which is 14 inches diameter, made out of you know, really good steel. And we drove a one-ton piston down it at high speeds, 300 meters per second, towards that area there where they're putting in the high-pressure section. This was back when it was being built. It would compress the hydrogen to about 6,000 psi, and then a release link would pop. And when the release link popped, the other secondary vehicle would travel up the other tube, which is at right angles, like my thumb is traveling, and it would go down there. And this was this was the business end of the system. So that, and you would get these scramjets for the Air Force coming out at Mach 9 or so. 
And we could have gone to Mach 18 with that system, but the, the, the Air Force never wanted. They were happy between Mach 7 and Mach 9 in those days. Next. Uh, this is an interesting piece of the project. We had to deal with some heavy metal parts. That inner part is the world's biggest forging of AF-1410. And AF-1410 is, is a super steel they use on arresting hooks for jet aircraft. It's 14% uh, cobalt, 10 nickel. And uh, that was the biggest forging, and we shrink-fitted them together. So in order to have favorable tensile stresses at the interior so that they wouldn't come apart during a shot, we had to, uh, that's, a, that's a blanket where we'd actually heat, out the, uh, heat the outer shell up and drop the inner shell in, and after 30 minutes it would go clink, it would lock in and put compressive stresses on the inner part. We did that three times because we had, I think we had four shells. And so uh, the other shells were made out of really good gun steel. Next. A couple of the guys, that's Paul Heston and Lou Bertolini, basically uh, getting the gun ready for a shot. You can see this is in a sort of a shielded area where they've got concrete blocks around everything. And they insert the scramjet from back here. And this is one of the reaction mass pistons. We had 100 tons on each side of the gun. It was like a big, a big uh, Rube Goldberg device where you know, I didn't want the gun to recoil, so, so to make the gun recoilless, I, stuck, I inserted masses on both the back section and the forward section, and this piston would go from one to the other, and it would transfer momentum from one to the other, so that these big 100-ton masses would move on railroad cars. We had them on railroad cars. It would kick the cars back and forth, and the gun was immobile, and it was extremely quiescent. The gun did not move during the shots. We actually could measure locations of things in the barrel with strain gauges because it was so quiet in terms of in terms of sending ripples down the tubes. You don't want to do that with a gas gun. So uh, this is loading the system up to get ready for a shot. Next. This is one of our first shots, uh, scramjets. This was a, an interesting uh, part of uh, science. That, uh, I don't know if you guys follow this little nuance of hypersonics, but you know, back in the day, they were trying to get uh, aircraft that would go from here to Australia in a few hours or so. You know, Mach 5 to Mach 10 aircraft, even, they were even talking Mach 20. I told the guys, well, before you get to Mach 20, why don't you start at the intermediate Mach numbers, just because, just to be careful. And they never did. They all, they, they burned through a couple billion dollars worth of money, but uh, it was a poorly one pr run program, and uh, we were, <laughs> we did help a little bit with our with our tests of the scramjets. We, in fact, we were we were reprimanded for doing this, Harry and me, by some guy. He says, well, you know, you guys are awfully entrepreneurial because we were launching scramjets at Mach 9. No one else did any free flight test in the world. They didn't do a single free flight test for two billion dollars. He got mad at us for doing that, okay, because we're sort of getting ahead of the guys. We're getting big bucks for doing basically studies. This was a scramjet. So we filled it with hydrogen at 6 KSI. We stuck it in the gun. We had some things which we would release the hydrogen at a certain time. It would, it would compress the, the air. As, as this thing runs through the air, it, sea level density air, it would stagnate the air, and it would, it would process the air. So the air was really hot when it got in the interior. It would auto-ignite when the hydrogen hit it. So then it would just, you know what a ramjet is. This was just a supersonic version of a ramjet, basically. All the kinetics and stuff would work out, and, and the thing would burn and provide thrust. So we launched a number of these for the Air Force. Next. There's one of them in flight. Now, these were taken with real high-speed cameras, so that's probably like a, I don't know, microsecond-type camera. We had all nanosecond to microsecond cameras. I lost track of, track of the prefixes. Next. Now, this is a little bit of Arcana. This, for those of you who aren't rocket scientists, uh, this is the first guy that really wrote down the rocket equation. It was a Russian dude, and he was, he was a deaf guy, and he was self-educated. He was a high school teacher in Russia, and he wrote down the, you know, MDVDTs, rho v squared, blah, 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 the, the standard stuff, and he integrated that, and he gets out this rocket equation. And the rocket equation tells you that your payload fraction depends very strongly on what kind of propellant you have, what kind of rocket fuel. And that's Konstantin Solkovsky. And, of course, during the, the V2 project, uh, in Germany, that's on the far right. There's, there's Werner von Braun, who was a Nazi, of course, and he worked. He ran slaves, and they built the V2s and bombed London, basically. Sent about a thousand v, V2s into London, and so we, of course, captured him. And uh, as part of Project Paperclip, took him and about a hundred guys, and made them work on our space program. And the Russians got about a hundred guys. Also, they captured about a hundred former Nazi scientists, also, and, and took them and made them their guys. And as a result, they beat us in they beat us into space. So Yuri Gagarin got the first orbit in the, in uh, back in '61. And John Glenn, who Harry's on a committee with John Glenn right now. So, but John Glenn got the, came in second, didn't he, Harry? Still tell him that. So, uh, okay. And of course, the, the crowning glory for all of us, I think, was was uh, I remember where I was when this happened. I was in a, I was fishing in Idaho for trout with one of my brothers. I remember this this scene though, 1969. 
And Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walk on the moon, right? And you get some really good quips and quotes in there. And the other guy has to orbit around him for a couple of times. So this is the history of rocketry, and I, I claim nothing really significant has happened since then, okay? Without being too cruel. Next. Now, on gun launch, there's an interesting background on guns, because the first guy to talk about using guns to go to orbit was Isaac Newton, the guy that had theoretically invented calculus. And uh, so he has this little thought experiment where the guy's on a hill and he shoots a gun out and he shoots the gun faster and faster and faster. Of course, it, they didn't have guns, they didn't have gas guns until 1946, but uh, theoretically, you have a high performance gun, you could launch things into orbit if you had no, no uh, air resistance and you're on a hill. So he was the first guy. Then Jules Verne in 1865 wrote this book called From the Earth to the Moon, where they were going to launch three guys to the moon with this giant thing called the Columbiad. And, uh, the book was a success, and it was one of his best sellers, you know, along with the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and you know, the Around the Earth in 80 Days. And then, of course, one of my favorite authors was Heinlein. Heinlein came along in 66. He was going to use a, an induction gun on the moon to launch rocks at the Earth during one of his, his uh, books. And uh, that, was, that would have been in 2075. That would have been a post-induction system. And I, by the way... You know, I've worked on those things. I don't know how to build pulse induction guns. They're, they're not, not a big deal. You just have a coil, you drive a current through it, and it repels another coil. This lens, it's diamagnetism, and lens is law. Problem is the energy, energy storage costs would kill you on the thing, and then stability, and there's a bunch of other issues. So the, putting the gas in a tube is actually much, much more effective and, and cheaper. But Heinlein had this idea. And then, of course, Gerard O'Neill, who was the guy that invented the synchrotron, incidentally, he's a really interesting guy. And, had sort of an unusual haircut, but basically uh, he was a brilliant, brilliant guy. He was a particle physicist, and he invented the mass driver uh, with a guy at MIT called Henry Colm, and they were going to build this thing, and they built some models. They never got above a few hundred meters per second, okay, because they had, they had a bunch of magnets and graduate students winding the magnets and stuff and putting them in epoxy and trying to drive this thing down a track, and they never got very fast, but it, he, had the, he had his heart in the right place. He wanted to supply mass from the moon to L5, a colony on L5. And that's one of the Lagrange, stable Lagrange points. And uh, so these are sort of the, the guys who were, who were uh, popularizers of, of using guns to do things regarding space. So there's a little bit of history, but none of them really seized on hydrogen gas guns. Next. Now, so, so now towards the end of this talk, uh, here's our first phase. This is just a, a SOLIDWORKS rendition of part of SuperHarp. So it turns out if you take the, the pump tube of SuperHarp, which is 240 feet long, and you fill a couple of tubes with hydrogen at, at 15 ksi and a little over 1,000 kelvin, you'll you'll bust the world record immediately. Okay, we'll get it within a few shots, and so we're gonna we're we're set up to do phase one, which would be a 20 phase test out of White Sands, and that's just with the current tubes which we have in storage in San Diego. So uh, we have partial ownership of that system with the Air Force right now. That is, Quick Launch has partial ownership. And you can see a little, a little uh, sounding rocket that we'd stick in there just th with some retro reflectors so you can be able to track it with radar so you can make sure you really pick the record up. And so that's a pretty vanilla system. That tube's only 14 inches ID, and it's about 17 OD for the, uh, uh, the parts, except for the first couple. It's only, it's only this big around, basically. And it's a few hundred feet long. I think it's 240 feet long total. So it's, you know, on a fairly vanilla gantry. And you just take... Uh, Take hydrogen and heat it up mildly. This is not a real hot shot. To get, to get this world record, you don't have to run it very hot at all. Uh, you get six kilometers per second. You've got to get the hydrogen fairly hot. And, and there's a heat exchanger for that system we have, we have to build. But that's that's a pretty nice nice easy shot. Next here. So summary, uh, what I wanted to convince you, if I, the best I can, is that hydrogen gas guns are well suited physically for for delivering payloads into low orbit. And we claim it'll be 5% of rocket costs, just fundamentally because you get rid of the first two stages of the rocket. You amortize the gun is, is an amortizable first stage. And then if you look at the numbers, you ought to go back, if you guys are interested in this, go back and look at the amount of propellant they use to go to send guys to the moon. Turns out, what I came up with as metrics was the, it takes 100,000 pounds of propellant in low orbit, 100,000 pounds, to send one person to the moon and back, pay for his return ticket. So that's what we actually spent. We spent a little bit more than that on the Apollo project. And if you analyze, I did that was real data. So I looked at real data from six or seven launches to the moon. 100,000. More than, it was actually 96% of the mass was propellant. It wasn't 90%, it was 96%. So propellant is the big item. 
Now you say you want to go to Mars. Well, it turns out, I looked at a couple studies, one by Von Braun, and the other one was by Boeing. And one, looked, one was using Nerva technology with 900 second ISPs. Von Braun's was very conservative with 280, 280 second storable liquids. And uh, I averaged those numbers and I came up with about a million pounds. You need a million pounds of propellant in low orbit to send one guy to Mars and back. A million, okay? There's no getting around that, okay? That's just the laws of physics. And so you need propellant in, in LEO, vast quantities, far more than you'll ever need of people or, or computers or anything else. It's, it's, it's going to be the elixir of space. So what we're proposing here is that rockets plus quick launchers will revitalize manned exploration in the 21st century of space. And uh, that's what we're going after right now. So, in fact, we're on our way to see a venture capitalist in your neck of the woods in about two hours. But we wanted to drop off here and say hi to you guys first. Okay, tell me, why do you have those three colors? What's the, with the three colors? I don't know. I just use Google as a search engine, but why is it? It's red and... Anyone know? I like them. I, I like them. I think it's great, but okay. Any questions, guys? Go ahead, sir. I'll go left, right. Okay, great. How much do you lose by launching from sea level as opposed to like on a mountainside? It, it depends on what size object. If you're talking a 100 kilo object, for example, you're going to lose about half a kilometer per second just to atmospheric okay, drag. Uh, if, and uh, if, if you went, of course, if you were at Mauna Kea, you'd probably lose about 200 meters per second. So it does make a little difference. If you're, if you're a much bigger vehicle, like we're proposing with a big system, it's almost non-existent. It just goes through, the, and I can show you the curves. But once you get past 10 kilos, you get out. You will get, the object will get out into space, okay, if you launch it, if it's pointy enough. And this is a hypersonic regime. And in a hypersonic regime, the drag is very easy to calculate, just twice the sine squared of the angle, okay, of the gizmo. And you've got a little bit of base drag, which is 1 over gamma m squared, where yeah, m's a Mach number, okay. So the drag is trivial to calculate once you're above Mach 5, okay. Bottom line is, anything above 10 kilos gets out, okay. But the penalty is, is smaller for small objects. It is smaller. Um, excuse me, the penalty is bigger for small objects, right? It's like on a football field, you know, you, they get hit. Yes, sir. Um, I hate to bring this up, but can you talk about, like, the uh, competition with the space elevator? Uh, well, actually, I know those guys. I, I like the space elevator guys. They, they bought me a beer last time I saw them. Uh, <laughs> no, that's probably Keith Lostrom and those people. And I actually, uh, I tend to be this little bit disdainful of people that I don't consider serious because this has got to be done while we're still alive, basically. But, but I actually like those guys. But let's put it this way. I spent two years doing an environmental assessment for our project for SuperHarp, and that wasn't something that could fall down and crush the town of Philadelphia, okay? If you built a space elevator like the one that you're talking about, aside from the issues of actually can you build it, you're going to have massive environmental issues to deal with. And, uh, the physics, I'm sure that most of the physics holds together, you know, because those guys know their physics. I talked to them about the electricity and magnetism and all this stuff. They know the physics. It's, it's fine. And they probably found some good high tensile materials like spectra to hold things together, which, you know, high yield, and they're looking for, of course, we're all looking for unobtainium. But, but uh, so I like the people. Uh, I, I, I don't consider them competitors, okay? Let's put it that way. So. Yes, sir? I've got two questions. One is the small satellite you showed that, could withstand 3,200 Gs. What actual yeah. testing did you do on that? Yeah, we took it to a place called National Test Systems in Largo, Florida. And what they did was they had a gas gun of a different sort. They had a, uh, a helium gun, which had a piston that would, that would drive this piston towards, towards the target, which in our case was the satellite, okay? And it would provide an impulse. And there was a little bit of helium between the piston and the thing, so it would sort of, the impulse would spike up like this. Okay, and you look at it on a, you put a scope trace on it, you get a couple scope traces to see what the G-loads were. And so then it would kick this thing off like, like, a, like a pool ball, okay, towards one of the pockets, and they would recover it at the end of the gun. So maybe 200 feet down, they would recover this, and it would run into some telephone boats and stuff like in their capture area, and we'd recover it, and uh, we would take it apart, and sure enough, it would work. The other one was, you said a couple times that this was 10 or 20 times more efficient than a chemical rocket. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you had a graph that was showing a couple different kinds of chemical rockets, if I understood it. But I don't, yeah. I didn't understand what you meant by this being more efficient. And oh, can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, better? what I meant was it, the the payload fraction is, is the bottom line for us. In other words, you've got to build a you've got to build a gizmo, right? It's got to be a, something you throw away. You never re, you're not going to recover this this rocket more than likely. 
Maybe you can, but that's, we're not arguing that case, okay? With a, with a conventional rocket, as you know, you rarely recover a conventional rocket like the Falcon 1s or Falcon 9s. And so the, 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 the figure of merit is, is how much payload do you have divided by the total mass of the rocket? In our case, that's 20, over 20%. In the case of Pegasus, Pegasus is one you may be familiar with. It's launched off of E-52. It's 1.4 percent. So if we're at 20, we're 28 percent. They're 1.4. We're 20 times better. Assuming everything costs the same on a per pound basis, if you did, if you assume, make that a quick assumption, which is not strictly true, but if you assume that, then you can see why we're at 20, we're at a 20 to 1 advantage. So those graphs you were showing were your device with different possible final stages. Actually, no. Those 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 graphs were the, the first graph was was the conventional was five thousand dollars per pound. Oh, excuse no, me. No, no, I'm talking about the, graph. the earlier graph with the box around. Right. There was yeah. There was actually six curves. Right. There was, there was six four. Curves or four curves here. Four. four curves. Okay. The top the top two curves were for a specific impulse a, a liquid rocket with a specific impulse of 320 seconds. That would probably be a LOX liquid In the final RP1. stage of your system. Correct. Okay. That's correct, yeah. Okay. For ours. And then the second curve was more like a solid rocket, more vanilla, but I don't want to launch them because if they detonate in the gun, we lose the gun. We lo we're down for six months on the gun, so I don't want to launch solids in the gun. Okay. The liquids are much safer to launch. You talked a little bit about a, uh, the front side heat shield, but you yeah. also need a back side heat sh shield, right? Uh, not significantly, no, because your, your heating rate goes like the density. And so, you know, your Q dot, which that's the so-called heating rate for these things, mm -hmm. is, we've, we've run analysis in it, and, and both, both with codes, with fluent, and scale composites. The guys, you know, the guys that just did the, uh, uh, they're, they're going for the, the uh, what's, it, what's it called here? The, the X Prize, yeah. We worked with those guys back in, in the late 90s and had them run codes for us. And there's, there's very modest heating on the backside. From the hydrogen? No, no, from the, oh, you're no, talking about during, the the, during yeah. in launch, right? Yeah. It's only in bore for less than a second. Okay? okay, it's only in bore for less than a second. And, and, if you, and it, see, the nice thing about this is I can go to a blackboard and show you the thermal diffusion time in, in less than a second is probably less than a millimeter on almost any material, okay, except for diamond. Okay, so. And, and how cool can you keep the payload? I mean, is it? Oh, uh, we're get, well, we blow the aeroshell off within a minute. So that aeroshell, which is like an inch thick, gets blown off within a minute. It's, it's basically, it's, it's soaking up heat, but it's also insulating from your, your payload, okay? So there will be a little air gap, and then, then you lose the heat shield entirely. It's just gone, okay? So then, then you're coasting uh, the remaining five or six minutes till you get to the depot, and you should be cool. Mm -hmm. you, shouldn't, you shouldn't have any, any heat issues. Are there issues with hydrogen embrittlement in your uh, steel barrel and your hot hydrogen? Yeah, gas? there were. I spent about three months going through that issue back in uh, the 90s with uh, when we when we built Super Harp because of hydrogen embrittlement concerns. So the trick is you pick a metal, uh, a steel, which is t typically has has a decent amount of uh, cobalt, stainless. You, you try to be sort of stainlessy, and then you also try to keep your the time that the system is hot down, and you try to keep the pressure down. Now it turns out for a lot of these systems. Uh, like the, the two-stage gun at Super Harp, we only had a high hydrogen there for less than a second, so there was no embrittlement issues. But we did have to analyze it quite a, quite a bit. But then it turns out if you have sustained temperature and pressure, okay, then you do have to worry. And so the on the on the aft section of this tube, the, the long the kilometer long gizmo, there's about 100 meters. We have to be concerned about that. So we'll probably stick a stainless alloy like you know uh, Invar. Our Invar or Hassaloy will be one of our liners on that part of the system to keep it from embrittling. And one thing we don't talk about is we have significant intellectual property on this thing, but what, you'll probably see some of this stuff in the Popular Science article, but we're going to make it out of composites. So the, the liner will be steel, and the rest of in the outer part is going to be uh, composite you know, graphite, like a Torre 740, for example, sporting goods graphite. And the benefit of that for the sea-launched version is that the thing is neutrally buoyant. So it's not going to sink to the bottom. If we made it out of pure steel, it would sink like, like an anvil to the bottom of the ocean. You'd have to really suspend it. But if you can make it out of composites, you can dial the densities trivially to make it neutrally buoyant, and that's what we want for the sea launch version. And the nice thing about that is when you build really big structures, they tend to have gravitational sag. You know, that's Galileo discovered that, that phenomenon, right? That's why elephants have really big ankles, right? And so, uh, it, so basically by putting it in the ocean, and make it neutrally buoyant, we get around that. We have no gravitational sag. So the barrels can be very straight. Uh, no problems with water currents changing the shape of the tube? 
Well, it turns out that the, that's more of a global thing. So, so the, the things you're talking about, like you're talking about, uh, there are currents in the ocean that are typically about a tenth of a meter per second in many cases, uh, down near the equator, which is our favorite location. And, but those are over you know, tens of miles, mile scales. So when you, when you do the math on that, uh, it turns out that's not an issue. Uh, two questions for you. Uh, one, uh, once you fired the ob object into space, mm -hmm. could you tell us a little bit more about how that's going to be propelled over and navigated into docking right. station? Right. And then uh, secondly, uh, the foil that you showed there with the gun suspended under the water, mm -hmm. there was a picture of the ocean above that. And I've, I've seen an ocean look like that once. <laughs> But more often than not, it doesn't look like right, that. Right, right. It, it all depends on what part of the ocean you're in. If that's the Atlantic. If it's a perfect storm, you're in trouble, right? Well, but the good news about the ocean is that basically after you've gone down a few meters, 10 meters or so, it's pretty quiet. And all the action is the first 10 meters. And this is a real stiff system. So I don't anticipate issues there. Also, the equatorial climbs tend to be a lot balmier than the stuff you saw with George Clooney and stuff being, being drowned in that movie. Okay? So I don't anticipate that being a problem. What was your other question? How do you navigate over to oh. the docking? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, basically, this thing is going to have some smarts on board, okay? And there will be obviously be, be some communications with the depot as well. And there's a thing called an attitude control system for rockets. ACS is what they call them. And uh, that, that tells you, okay, uh, I want to go towards that star and then make a jog towards Neptune, okay? Had little star seekers and things like that and Earth, Earth detectors. Things like that. And of course, these days you have GPS that would work as well for us, get us within a few meters. So we have all the smarts, you, the smarts, all the smarts you can imagine, you're buying for your wife this Christmas, basically. Okay? Oh, yeah. Uh, as far as the, uh, what you saw there in that little, uh, that little picture, JPEG, was, was basically an RP1 LOX system, okay, at 3 and 20 second ISP. So one's cryogenic and one's not. The, the fuel of the, the RP1 is not cryogenic, just ordinary, it's basically kerosene. And uh, you burn that. You have a couple of igniters on that thing. It only burns for 100 seconds. And then the whole thing is there's, there's some uh, IP here, but basically we spin this. And uh, I, have, I have a toy company too, okay? You may not know this, but I have a toy company called Star Sports, and we specialize in things that fly. And if you look on the net and go to, uh, go to Zyklone, just type in Zyklone, you'll see one of my gizmos that we license to Zinc. And it's basically a flying ring. You know, the ring is a lifting body. You take a wedding ring off like this. You spin it, okay? It's a lifting body, and it will it will fly because it's got a lift to drag ratio of ten to one. Frisbee is about four, okay? It's, it's two or three times better than a frisbee. So what? So I tend to work on things that spin, and uh, and so in fact that's one of the it, the IP issues we came up with. We're going to spin this this body, and then it turns out you can drive precession with a single ACS thruster. Everyone else uses six thrusters. So you know, in in, in the God bless NASA, but I mean, they, the more guys they can stack on a problem to make it expensive, the better, right? And we go the other way. We want to make this while well, we're still young, right, Rick? Still in our 80s. <laughs> so that's the goal. We want to make this uh, affordable and quick, as in quick launch. Did you, you have a question, Miss? Sir? You guys, all, you guys all good? Okay. Can you show it here? The other one. Can you run the first part of that to kind of narrate the first second or two? What, what's the mechanism of this? Can you run it again here? Sure. This is the uh, the opening switch. You can back. Can you back it up? <laughs> Anyways, uh, conventional gas cow, gas guns have a diaphragm and it blows. It just, it just fractures like this. The four pedals go out. This is a more subtle one. So it. It uh, allows the hydrogen to get behind the vehicle. What's the energy source for running that first piston? Yeah, in, in this case, I may have misled you. You know, Sharp, the super gun that we have now, has a piston in it. The one you're seeing here, the quick launch, does not have a piston. There's no piston. Pistons tend to be, uh, 
they have a lot of momentum associated with them, so it causes problem engineering issues. So what we're going to do in this area to the right, we have a heat exchanger that's not shown there. So we, we send the, the hydrogen in at about 2 to 3 KSI. So conventional hydrogen, you can buy hydrogen off from the welder supply at 3 KSI if you want to. Okay? You inject it into the base section, and then we use liquid natural gas, which we gasify, mix with, with, with air, flow it in there, and it, it drives the heat exchanger. So it heats the heat exchanger up, so this whole thing rises in temperature and pressure. So the, the, the uh, temperature goes from 300 Kelvin to 1,700 Kelvin, and the pressure goes from, say, 2,600 PSI to 15 KSI. And then at that point, you're ready to release the, release the hounds, okay? And that, that heating cycle is a few seconds? Or? It's about 10 minutes. Yeah, because we've got to burn a lot of our, we got to burn a lot of natural gas. This thing is huge. I mean, this is not a small system. Uh, you can't tell if there's no, there's no people in it for scale, but it's, that's a, over a kilometer long. That tube there, the base section is four meters, so that's like 15 feet. And over here, it's two meters, two and a half meters, you know, so that's so you know, you approaching 10. So if you added oxygen to that hydrogen and just burned it in place, the molecular weight would go up too much? And yeah. It turns out, if you do the trick where you just take hydrogen and you burn it with, with oxygen, you, it turns out you top out about three to four kilometers per second. Because, it, like you said, your molecular weight goes up, and now you have steam, and so it's, it's not the best. But it, if you only want to get to, say, three or four kilometers per second, that's the fastest way to get there. And that was called the steam gun. They did a bunch of stuff with that in the 60s. A guy named Lord did a bunch of work with steam guns. We go with You bet.